1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, the Bible reads, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Our Father, I pray that your word would go forth with power, give us ears to hear, guard my tongue from error, and soften our hearts so that the Holy Spirit would teach us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of this morning's message is The Communion of the Body of Christ. The Communion of the Body of Christ. I'm going to start by throwing out a few questions to you. Don't answer them, just kind of let them sit for a moment. What is the body of Christ? What does it mean to discern the body of Christ? What is communion really? Uh, we are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, so here's another question. This one's a little easier. Is the Lord's Supper important? Is the Lord's Supper important? As Christians, we know that it is. Uh, we're going to see that in a few moments when we look at uh, the next chapter, chapter 11. But the Apostle Paul, and we'll see that, he treats it as a very sober event. He treats it as a very important thing. So is communion or the Lord's Supper important? Okay, now you can answer. Is it important? Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. But honestly, sometimes when I look and survey the whole of evangelical Christianity, sometimes I wonder, do people really view it as important? It's not always treated that way, but it should be because it is important. Let's start out with the word itself, communion. What does that mean? Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16 again. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The Greek word translated communion is koinonia. And what it means is simply fellowship, uh, association with, community, right? You hear that word community in in communion, uh, joint participation. So the Lord's Supper is a time to commune with God. It is a time to commune with God's people. Fellowship with God, fellowship with his people. And of course, who is Paul writing to? Well, he's writing to a local church. And this is where we experience communion with God and with his people. Maybe it's not the only place we do it, but that primarily is where we experience fellowship, communion with the Lord and with his people as a group, as a congregation, as an assembly. Uh, if somebody were to partake of the Lord's Supper at home by themselves, they're kind of missing the point. So I was thinking about this because one of the common questions regarding uh, communion, and that's not going to be what the sermon is about, all the differences people have, but one of the common things that comes up, how often should communion be observed, right? This is kind of one of those basic uh, questions people talk about. Well, those churches every that have it every Sunday, because a lot of people say, well, then it becomes rote and just mechanical if you have it, have it every week. Well, here's the thing that I've come to as a conclusion. Those churches that do have it every Sunday, I don't think they're wrong. I don't think they're wrong. People say, well, if you have the Lord's Supper every week, I mean, that's a little much, isn't it? Well, but you know, there's some people who say that about church attendance uh, in general. You go to church every week? I mean, that's, that's a little much, isn't it? <laughs> and listen, I'm not trying to make the case that we should have the Lord's Supper every week. Uh, the Lord's Supper is something that brings us together. This is something where we experience and should experience unity. I don't want to get into things that divide us. Okay, that's not my intention uh, here. But I do want to faithfully communicate what Paul is trying to faithfully 
uh, communicate. So as Christians, we should want, here's the point, we should want to commune with God. As Christians, we should want to have fellowship with God's people. If you love someone, you want to spend time with them. Amen. If you love God, you want to have that communion, spending time, fellowship with God. If you love God's people, you want to experience communion with the church. And if someone is really a, a valuable part of your life, when you don't see them for a few days or a week, what happens? You, you can't wait to see them again. So when the church gathers in obedience to Christ, this is a special thing. Amen. You might think, well, it's normal. It happens all the time. No, this is a special thing. It is communion with God. Whether we eat the bread and drink the cup, um, it is communion with God and with his people. So, uh, what is communion all about? I'd like to read what one commentator wrote. This is Matthew Henry. He said this about this passage from 1 Corinthians 10. He writes, Joining together in the Lord's Supper shows a profession of faith in Christ crucified as well as an adoring gratitude to him for his salvation. Christians, by this ordinance and the faith therein professed, are united in Christ, as grains of wheat are united in one loaf of bread. So this is a time of fellowship with God, fellowship with God's people. And one of the ways we do that is eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. And that is a time where we remember what Jesus did in dying on the cross for the forgiveness of of sin. It's also a testimony of our faith. When we eat and drink, we're, we're doing it publicly. Again, not at home by ourselves where nobody sees it, nobody knows. We're doing it publicly. So when you eat, you're doing it around others. It's a profession of faith, really, just as baptism is a profession of faith. So communion is a wonderful thing. It is a beautiful thing. Now, with that said, <laughs> Anything that's wonderful, anything that's beautiful and is of God and comes from God, because we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, we know what the devil wants to do, right? Uh, he wants to spoil this. This is a, a wonderful thing. He wants to ruin it. So where God's people have unity, the devil loves to create disunity. For those of you who know church history, you know that this subject of the Lord's Supper and Communion, this is one of the most divisive issues the church has argued about and debated about, or churches have argued and debated throughout, throughout history. Uh, and I, I've preached on these subjects before and taught on these subjects before. You know, the real presence of Christ and transubstantiation and consubstantiation and the memorial view. And we're not going to get into all of that this morning. Uh, there's also the things people argue about. Uh, should churches have open communion or closed communion? Should you use actual wine or Welch's grape juice? And you say, well, um, it says it's supposed to be unleavened bread. It's the feast of unleavened bread. Why are we using Wonder Bread? You know? <laughs> hey, listen, getting into some of those things, that's a good way to start an argument, right? <laughs> that's not what I'm concerned about this morning. Although I have heard of some youth ministries and Christian camps, youth pastors who uh, observe the Lord's Supper with the kids using Doritos and Coca-Cola. Um, please don't do that. You know, I think there are some things worthy of rebuke and uh, spirited debate. But, but just to, in all seriousness, I am serious, but uh, uh, just to stay within the confines of Scripture here, Let's look at the next chapter. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because this is what I would consider the primary text in the New Testament concerning communion or the Lord's Supper. I think it's interesting. Uh, one day this kind of just dawned on me. Outside of the Gospels, which record the actual event where Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it's hard for me not to notice that the New Testament doesn't really say all that much 
uh, about the topic. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I don't make too big of an issue concerning some of these things, because quite frankly, the Bible just doesn't tell us all that much. But it does say enough. It does tell us enough. Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper is recorded in all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's recorded in John. Many of the details are recorded in John. But outside of the Gospels, there's a few passing references maybe. But 1 Corinthians 11, this, this is the main text. So let's begin reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. And this is all building up to us observing and celebrating the Lord's Supper. So we should be preparing our hearts as we go. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. All right, let, let's just stop there. You can see that there are some problems that this church is going through, right? Communion is supposed to be a time of unity, but this congregation, in this congregation, there were great divisions. And they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, and the way they were doing it only served to make those divisions worse. One commentator writes this, the worldly carnal church at Corinth had turned these sacred meals into gluttonous, drunken revelries. Beyond that, wealthy believers brought ample food and drink for themselves, but refused to share, letting their poorer brethren go away hungry. That's what is happening. And Paul explains this. Look at verses 20 through 22. He says, therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, and another is what? Oh. What? <laughs> and another is drunk. Oh. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? and shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So let's just skip ahead now to verse 27. A very serious passage, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 28. Therefore, Paul says, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, you will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That word examine means to test, right? To test, to scrutinize, to prove yourself. To prove yourself. Are you worthy to Partake. Now, I think it's a common uh, response to have this kind of pious response. Well, oh, no, I'm, I'm not worthy. Nobody is worthy. I think that's false. Okay, I think that's false. Mm -hmm. If you are saved, you are at least potentially worthy. <laughs> Can we at least say that? Yes. If you are in covenant with God through Jesus Christ, you have the right to partake because the Lord has made you worthy. But with that said, he does mention that there are some, it seems, who would be partaking in an unworthy manner. So what does that mean? What does it mean to partake in an unworthy manner? First of all, let's just kind of throw out the obvious. If you're not a Christian, you don't have any uh, unity with God. Uh, you have no union with Christ. So if you're an unbeliever, then of course, you are not worthy to partake. You should not partake. But what about saved, born-again believers in Christ? Just think of this here. Paul is telling a legitimate New Testament church, you better examine yourselves so that you don't eat and drink in an unworthy manner. So we know that that's possible for believers to partake in this 
unworthy manner. And what if people do? What happens? They become guilty of what? The, the body and the blood of the Lord. So what does this mean to partake in an unworthy manner? Verse 29, Paul says this, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. So you can't read this and come to the conclusion, well, this really isn't all that important. That's impossible. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, that is, they've died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Now, it should go without saying that Paul's purpose, his intentions in writing to the church was so that they would, number one, understand uh, what he was saying, see what the problem was, and then fix it, right? I mean, that's, that's obvious why he's writing. Identify the problem. Here's what you shouldn't be doing. Make these steps to correct it. So when Paul talks about eating and drinking in an unworthy manner, obviously they need to know what he's talking about. So what is he talking about? The answer is in the text. The answer has to be in the text, otherwise there'd be no, no way to know. So Paul explains it. What does it mean to partake in an unworthy manner? Well, uh, the fact is they were causing divisions in the church. They were mistreating one another. They were not sharing. They were sinning. They were, they were getting drunk, some of them not waiting for each other, not being considerate. We know that that's what he's talking about because that's what he writes. If you ever want to know what a verse in Scripture means, you compare Scripture with Scripture, that's true, but you do what? One of the most basic things, taking things in context, you read the verses before and you read the verses after. And then this statement about not discerning the Lord's body. Well, what does that mean? A lot of debate and speculation, not discerning the Lord's body. It's not that difficult. What is the body of Christ? The church is the body of Christ. Paul will go on to explain that in the next chapter, chapter 12. Now the bread and the cup represent the flesh and blood of Jesus that were broken or shed on, on the cross. Here's the point. They were dishonoring the body of Christ. They were dishonoring the church. They were disrespecting one another. They were mistreating their fellow brothers and sisters. And in the process, they turned holy communion into an unholy commotion. And being the early days of the church, the Lord made an example out of some of them. It's like in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. The Lord made an example out of them. And that's what happened here. The Lord struck some of them with sickness and even death to show the church how serious this is. Someone might ask, Pastor, do you think the Lord still does that today? I don't want to find out. <laughs> the church at Corinth was very much divided. We know that. You remember how some of them, I am of Paul, you know, I'm in the Peter group, I'm in the Apollos group, and they were kind of <laughs> arguing, you know, we're better than you. Our faction is better than this faction. Causing division in the church. Here, if you take notes, write this down. Write this down if you take notes. Causing division in a church is one of the things that the Lord hates. The Lord wants unity. He hates those who are trying to cause disunity, or he hates the act of doing it. And, and listen, don't let your mind drift to the, the universal church and churches all over the world, you know, Christians all over the world. Who's he writing to? He's writing to a local church. Let's focus on unity in a local church. 
Again, causing division in a church is something the Lord hates. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. So, well, my God doesn't hate anything. Well, okay. Proverbs 6 says, These six things the Lord hates, and yes, seven are an abomination to him. That's in my Bible. I don't know if it's in yours, but it's in, it's, it's in the Bible. Okay, trust me. <laughs> Look it up. Double check. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and here's the one to pay attention to for this sermon, the one who sows discord among brethren. According to the Bible, it is an abomination. One of the strongest words that you could possibly use. It is an abomination to sow discord among brethren. And this is what some of the church members were doing. There were factions. There was likely gossip, backbiting. People were running down the church leadership. We know there were people uh, attacking the Apostle Paul. Uh, we covered that in 2 Corinthians. So let's take all of this information and kind of bring it down to our level. Let's make that application. What would that look like in a local church today? <laughs> Partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner would be eating the bread and drinking the cup when you have hostility in your heart towards another church member. That is partaking in an unworthy manner. Harboring ill will. Running down the deacons. Running down the deacons. Running down the pastor. That's true. But running down each other. Right? Running down one another, that is sowing seeds of discord in a local church. Just having that kind of critical, unforgiving spirit. We need grace. We all, we all need grace. Amen. This is what it means to partake in an unworthy manner. These are sins that Jesus died for. These things shouldn't be happening in a local church, but... Paul's writing this, why? Because he knows that it is. And from personal experience, we all know that these things do happen. <coughs> Some of you have been in churches where this, kind, this was standard operating procedure. This is just the way the culture of the church was, and you know how troublesome eh, it was. But if there are seeds of discontentment, and, I, and thankfully, I don't think that's a a big problem here. But if there are seeds of discontentment and irritation between you and a fellow believer, we all kind of get on each other's nerves at times. I mean, that's kind of, that's life. I mean, that happens and that's... But if you can let something go, hey, let it go. Or maybe as we approach the Lord's Supper, maybe you know that you have maybe mistreated someone, you feel bad about it, the thing to do is to go to that person and try to make that right. Amen. Ask for forgiveness. Amen. Something, uh, something will happen. Maybe we we take it out on someone else, right? Things happen in someone's own personal life, and they take it out on someone else. They they don't want to. They don't mean to. But these are things that are normal. They have. We don't like to admit we're wrong. That's another thing. We try, that person's wrong, and we don't want to take accountability. So these are all things to maybe keep in mind, and, you know, if any of us say, well, okay, I should make this right, should make that right, then make it right, okay? Pray to God before we partake. Say, Lord, I, I've done this. You know it. it. It was wrong. Please forgive me, and then go to that person later on and say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. Now, if you've been harboring just a piece of personal advice from me, it's not in the Bible, but uh, you do what you feel is right. If you've had this hatred or like this anger in your heart towards someone and they're just totally uh, unaware of it, maybe going and telling them that isn't the best thing to do. You know, keep it, if it's between you and God, keep it between you and God. But these are all things that. Uh, can happen in a church, and, and Paul is preaching this, he's writing this, um, and I preach this sermon because we either want to make things right or make sure they don't get to that. So 
Before we partake, uh, let's spend a few moments in self-examination and prayer. I'll read these verses again from chapter 10. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Paul writes in chapter 11, starting in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then he finishes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And we're looking forward to his coming. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, let's close with a hymn. We'll sing hymn number 132. We'll give you a moment to put your uh, cup down and open in your hymnal. Hymn number 132. A lot of hymns on angels this morning. We're getting all the uh, angelic hymns uh, covered in one service. Hymn number 132, please rise. <laughs> 